Hello, welcome everyone to Future World's Demo Day 23. We are delighted that you could be here at the BFI, this iconic home of British cinema, uh, a bastion of the creative industries here in the UK. And of course, we're here to celebrate the tech sector in the UK, which we know is a, a true gem, a powerhouse of the country. But why are we here? Well, my name is Ben Clark. I have the privilege, thanks Ruben, of being the director of Future Worlds, the on-campus startup accelerator at the university of Southampton. We exist to help the staggeringly brilliant scientists and engineers at the University of Southampton to go from ideas in the lab to startups that change the world. But why are we here in London and why Southampton? Well, I grew up in London. I knew from the start that it was and is the greatest city in the world. But later in life, I discovered there really is life outside the M25. Shock, I know, to many of you. But down through the centuries, Southampton has been a gateway, a gateway to the rest of the world. And there are many things about Southampton that make it the source of incredible startup talent. Many of you will recognize the Titanic that famously sailed from Southampton, a ship that tragically sank, a, a ship that wasn't even built in Southampton, that for too long has defined a city by a tragedy where many from the city were lost who were crew on that ship. More excitingly, the fish finger was launched in <laughs> Southampton. And down through the generations, many students across the country have had a high omega-3 diet as a result. <laughs> and many of the brilliant engineers at Southampton, I'm sure, dined out on fish fingers while they were developing the erbium-doped fiber optic amplifier. Indeed, people in this room, part of that group, a game-changing breakthrough without which we would not have long-range fiber optic communication. The internet as we know it would not exist without the technology from the university in Southampton. The engineers there just made it work because that's what they do. Also, the wind tunnel at Southampton, the RJ Mitchell wind tunnel, named in recognition of the brilliant engineer who designed and built the Spitfire in Southampton. A marvel of engineering so profound that it protected Western liberal values at a time when they were under threat. And of course, the people of Southampton stepped up under great duress to assemble it, spread across small shops and halls across the city to evade the bombs that were targeting the factory. They did it because that's what they do. They just made it work. And it's that resilience, it's that grit, that determination to just make it work that are the qualities that every great startup founder depends upon. And we look forward to seeing six of those this, this afternoon. But 400 years earlier, another ship set sail from Southampton, the Mayflower, that carried the first Western settlers to the shores of what became the United States of America. They risked everything. They risked their lives for a better life, for a better future, not knowing where the journey would take them. And of course, down through the centuries, history has told us where that has led. And of course, that is the spirit of adventurous ocean sailing that permeates so much of what makes Southampton what it is. And when you're sailing, you need the capital to buy a boat that's good enough, hopefully, to make it to the other side of the ocean. But the capital alone is worthless without a crew that has the capability, the courage, the commitment, the determination to go well beyond the point of no return. <laughs> to reach the other side. And of course, those are the qualities that you need in a startup founder, the courage, the conviction, the commitment, the capability to do something that has not been done before, that you might look back and say, well, it was obvious, wasn't it? But at the beginning of the journey, it seemed impossible. The reality is there's so much talk at the moment about the UK as a science and technology superpower of being the unicorn kingdom, of being the next Silicon Valley. Well, the reality is without Southampton's Mayflower, without its Spitfire, without the erbium-doped fiber optic amplifier, there wouldn't be a Silicon Valley as we know it today. But the reality is also, whether it's there or whether it's here, it comes down to brilliantly talented individuals who have got the courage, the conviction, the commitment, the capability to do what might be unthinkable at the beginning. 
And that's why every year we take our cohort of startup founders out, retracing the steps of that Mayflower journey, but over to the West Coast, to San Francisco, where we experience a culture and a mindset of openness, of optimism, of risk-taking, of a willingness to get behind, to honor and to esteem those brilliantly talented tech founders. Asking them the question, why not, replaced instead of the skeptics, why? Asking, why not bigger? How big could this go? And that mindset is what these founders have brought back this year from San Francisco as they prepare for today's demo day. If you're sitting here with capital today, then the exciting news is there are six startup founders who will be pitching today with the capability, the courage, the conviction, and the commitment to go on a journey that could, that will change the world. But before we meet them, there are a few thank yous that I want to mention. Firstly, to the University of Southampton, the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences, without which none of this would be happening. A thank you to the many corporate partners, many of you here in this room, who have given your cash, your time, your resources to support these great startup founders to start their journey. Critically, to the many mentors and investors, many of you in this room who have given your time so generously to support the journeys right on these first steps, the highest risk moments, the most definitive moments in a startup journey. Thank you all for all of the commitments and the generosity that you have shown. It makes an enormous difference. Finally, I want to say thank you to the wonderful Future Worlds team, to Alex, to Alice, to John, to Kate, Thank you. Without this, none of this would happen. Without your day-to-day, day-in, day-out commitment to make all of this a reality. Thank you to you. But now, let's get to business. The first thing I want to ask each of you to do is show me your phone, your tablet, your laptop, whatever device you're most comfortable using. But we want you to be asking questions of each of the startups. They'll be pitching, and then we're going to be taking questions from the audience. But the questions will be through that QR code. If you don't use the QR code, you can use futureworlds.com forward slash ask. The QR code is also in your programs, so you can scan it there if you'd find it easier than using the screen. We want to hear your questions, uh, but put them through the form. We won't be going with a roving mic. The room's too big. But finally... The reason that we are here is to connect the right people with these talented individuals to help them to go on a journey that could change the world. And those people are you. So there is a separate QR code, a separate form. If you can open your browser and have two tabs open, that would be ideal. Leave this form open in the background. After every pitch, I'm going to be reminding you about this form. If you want to connect with the startup, then please use that form. Uh, Jot some notes in there about why you want to connect, what it is that you're bringing, because we would love to connect you with these startup founders. That is what today is all about. It is about brilliantly talented startup founders pitching to a room of people sitting on a sea of capital, a sea of experience and expertise. And we have seen time and time again, when you put that together, incredible things happen. And so let me welcome to the stage Tamara Ivanchova. Amara Automotive is building the future of transport. Did you know you're currently 24 times more likely to die from air pollution than from a car accident? Luckily though, electric cars are getting more and more popular and I'm sure you've heard there's zero emission. Now this would be great if it was actually true. In reality, electric cars only reduce emissions by 50% in use and in production they're actually 46% worse. So clearly, their mass adoption is not the solution. And considering that the majority of car journeys are already under five miles and made by just one person, cycling is the obvious solution to eliminate travel pollution. Unfortunately, this is the reality of cycling. 
It's seen as unsafe and uncomfortable, so just 4% of the UK cycle. But don't worry, we have the solution. This is the LSE, a safe four-wheeled e-bike which gives you the comfort of a car at the minimal recurring costs and emissions of regular e-bikes. So let's imagine you swap your car out for the LSE on your commute. Whether you're traveling to work or doing the school run, you ride in comfort, fully protected, benefiting from electric assistance as you pedal. You use the cycle lanes to overtake the traffic that you're usually stuck in, and you get all this time saving at a negligible running cost. When you arrive, you can park anywhere bikes can, and you can park without worry thanks to our security features. To recharge, simply remove the battery and charge on mains power anywhere. Now, the LSE is a good fit for multiple markets, but we're focusing on direct-to-consumer, which presents the biggest opportunity. We will sell and lease the LSE, initially targeting UK and EU drivers who travel alone for below 10 miles. And just for these journeys, our total addressable European market is worth £37 billion. And it's growing rapidly. By 2028, it will be worth over £73 billion, and you have the chance to join us now to see how much we will capture. But of course, with a growing market comes competition. But as you can see, the LSE is outperforming our competitors because none offer the same levels of safety and comfort whilst being built sustainably. Podbike is our closest competitor, but their e-bike weighs twice as much and cannot be ridden without a battery. Despite this, they've gained over 32,000 registrations of interest and over 3.7 thousand pre-orders, totaling more than 22 million pounds. But they tried to do too much too fast, and it took them over six years to get to production. And there are three reasons why we're going to do better. Number one is our ethos. The fact that we minimize emissions at every stage results in incomparably lighter and better performing vehicles. Number two, our construction method is scalable and it's backed by Innovate UK funding. Our method cuts costs by over 84% without compromising the strength. And it cannot easily be replicated by established manufacturers due to their reliance on existing infrastructure. And three, our route to market is realistic. In year one, we will de-risk production with a limited 100 units built and sold. And we will scale rapidly post-revenue. Now, on top of all of this, you're going to want to back our team. I'm Tamara, the founder, and I'm obsessed with cars. I've been driving since I was three. At 15, I was working in Formula One. But I decided to leave the motorsport industry with the goal to set a new standard across the transport sector to make travel sustainable. Our team is growing, and we have the support of these organizations and many more to help accelerate that growth. And we're aware that our mission is ambitious. But as you've seen, we have the right team, we have the right ethos, and we have the right technology to make it a reality. Our technology will disrupt the way vehicles are designed and built across the entire transport sector to make net zero happen. And to get there faster, we need 600,000 pounds. This will give us a 12-month runway during which we'll reach production readiness, TRL9, and get e-bike certification. Following this, we will open up pre-orders and set up the production line in Q3 of 2024. And we aim to complete this round by raising 150,000 pounds, which will unlock an extra 450,000 pounds via grant funding. So today, we're looking for investors as well as advisors who share our vision and have experience within transport, mobility, climate tech, or international trade. So come on board and make our mission a reality. And book your test ride today by registering interest at tomorrowautomotive.com. Thank you. So a reminder, we want your questions. So please make sure you have scanned that QR code while I try to log back into my laptop so that I can see your questions. Uh, and make sure you put your questions in to Tamara. So I can see Simon. Simon Yarwood has asked, um, are there any regulatory barriers to the bike's use on roads and in bike lanes? Yeah, really good question. Thank you for that. 
Um, the LSC is designed directly with the e-bike regulations in mind. So it's classified as an electric assist pedal cycle and fits the same regulations as uh, your regular two-wheeled e-bikes. And these regulations are the same for both UK and Europe and have been in place for years. Um, so yeah, the lucky thing is we fit directly into them and we meet them and we are allowed on the roads in the same way that regular e-bikes are. Fantastic. There's another question. Why aren't vehicles like this on the roads already? Why don't we see vehicles like this now? Yeah, really good question. You'd think that sort of lightweight vehicles like this, um, which fit directly with the micromobility movement, would be seen already. But there are a few people who have tried to do it in the past, but never reached the mainstream market, the Sinclair C5 being an example. And fundamentally, the reason for that is because they don't address the three biggest issues um, that prevent people from adopting them, which is safety, comfort, and practicality. Some who have tried to make it address one of them really well, but not the rest. And what we're doing differently is actually addressing all of them as a priority to make this a truly attractive, functional, and viable vehicle for the masses. Great, and I can see Toby has asked, how many bikes have been constructed? And does that mean that the, the methods and tools are in place to, to go further? And Marius, a similar question is asked, what is it that's, that's really innovative and, and unique about your manufacturing methods? Yeah, really good question. So our focus has been on developing these methods um, and we're conducting a specific grant to take the methods that we have, that we've made prototypes with, for example, for the chassis construction, which I talk about in the pitch, um, and we're taking that to high scale production. Um, we are nearly finished with the first full-scale prototype that we'll be testing and crash testing later on this year. But really the innovation with our methods comes from the materials we use, but also the way that we design our vehicles. So to give you a little bit more context, the, it's composite construction and the materials we use are waste carbon fiber from the aerospace industry. So we're cutting down on the waste, which also then cuts down our costs but we have developed a method so that we can still make panels which have the same strength to weight properties. Great, and uh, Kate has asked, is there likely to be pushback on something looking a bit like a car using bike lanes? And how do traditional cyclists view this? Yeah, really good question. Um, so it's expected there to be, but there are already similar vehicles on the road, although they don't target personal users, but. I'm sure you've seen um, four-wheeled cargo e-bikes who use the cyclones regularly in London. There hasn't been significant pushback um, due to that. So we're not anticipating this to be a problem. Okay, and Ian has asked, um, if your competitor took six years to get to market, how do you know that you're going to be quicker? Yeah, well, we understand why they took that, that long. For, firstly, hardware, especially a vehicle like this, which is safety critical, um, takes time to get to market and you need to perfect these manufacturing methods. We have been developing them for a while, but also the main flaw with Podbike was they tried to go from zero to a couple of thousands in one year. And that takes significant capital to build up a production line that's worth, um, that's capable of delivering those kinds of numbers. We are starting smaller to make sure it's a strategic way to ensure that we can get to market quickly so people can see our vehicles on the roads and the perception can be built up of our brand but also it requires significantly less capital to get to that stage. And then we can, we'll be revenue generating and we will require significantly less investment to get to the further stages of higher volume production. Okay, I can, and, and you talk about going to higher volume production. Ruben has said, assuming this is a one-off sale, what's the gross margin look like? Yeah, really good question. Once we get to high volume production, so we're talking in the high thousands, we'll be between 50 to 60% of a profit margin, but I can talk to you in more detail offline. Uh, and then um, Mike uh, Payne has asked, where will you manufacture this in quantity once you get to scale? Uh, so once we get to scale, we are currently between three countries that we're considering. So all of that is in the works to find the one that would work the best logistically um, and yeah in every way. Okay, and then one final question. Alistair has asked, if it's lightweight, then how much safer is it versus a bike? Yeah, really good question. Um, so in terms of safety levels, it's somewhere between bikes and cars. We have designed it to be able to withstand the sort of impacts that you can expect within its use case, which is city commuting. And we have crash testing booked later on this year 
to quantify those numbers exactly. But fundamentally, we are adopting an approach used in motorsport. You see Formula One cars crashing at 63 Gs and the rider coming out with no injuries. Um, and we are applying those and applying them to our scale to ensure that the impacts that we're targeting, which are significantly less than that, can be withstood with our method. Tamara, thank you very much indeed. A round of applause for you. So a reminder, make sure you've got the connect form open. If you want to connect with Tamara, then make sure you fill out that form, uh, put some details in there. Uh, the reality is we're most keen that you connect. So if you'd rather WhatsApp me, email me, email the team, uh, send smoke signals, whatever it is that works for you. But ideally, use that form. That's the easiest from our side. So make sure you are ready. Without any further delay, let's welcome to the stage Till Jordan. Hi, I'm Till, co-founder and CEO of L0, the first platform for realistic blockchain simulation. Imagine a world without the internet, a world where we can't stream our favorite shows, connect with friends and family across the globe, or even look up basic information. It's almost impossible to imagine, but it only started 30 years ago with Web1, a static internet that only provided information to users. Since then, we have evolved to Web2, where we have social media and real-time communication. But now, we stand on the brink of a new era of the internet, Web3, a decentralized internet where power is distributed among its users and where we can take back control of our online lives. You have probably heard about blockchain through cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but the true potential of the technology lies in powering the third generation of the internet. But the technology is not ready yet. Blockchain is a complex network of computers, which is why it's still suffering from basic issues with performance and security. For example, last year, one of the biggest blockchain networks experienced an outage just because of one misconfigured computer. Just this one outage cost the company more than $1 billion in company value. At L0, we have developed the first platform for realistic blockchain simulation in order to predict and avoid issues with performance and security. Our platform can simulate realistic networks, workloads, and cyber attacks, saving companies billions of dollars and bringing us one step closer to Web3. But what companies would use our platform? First, we have blockchain infrastructure companies who are responsible for the development of blockchain networks. These companies have a budget of more than $10 billion dedicated exactly to these kinds of problems. Next, we have companies who build on top of blockchain networks. These companies include blockchain wallets, crypto exchanges, and node providers, with a total market size of $14.1 billion. And last, we have blockchain consultancies, which already have a market value of $4.7 billion, but expected to reach $20 billion just in the next four years. Now, you might wonder what proof we have that our product fits within this huge market. We have developed an MVP that's already live, and we have traction for each of these layers. We have successfully tested our platform with three blockchain consultancies. We're in close talks with multiple blockchain wallets and crypto exchanges, and have secured two node providers as our partners. And finally, we have a blockchain company who is paying us $40,000 just as an onboarding fee, with an expected yearly recurring revenue of $200,000. We're charging companies on demand for simulations, a subscription fee for access to the platform, and additional fees for technical support. Our platform is fully cloud-based, giving us a profit margin of more than 90%. And we're the only platform that has all the tools needed to successfully improve blockchain. 
There are a few open source tools which analyze and simulate blockchains, but they have insufficient capabilities. Metrica monitors blockchains in real time, but does not provide the tools to fix problems. And Chainalysis monitors financial crime and cryptocurrencies, but does not provide any tools for the underlying blockchain networks. Our founding team ranges from PhD level experts in blockchain to computer science professors. Stefano and Federico work at relevant companies in the industry, and Leonardo and Vladimir have years of research experience in the field. I have been part of multiple entrepreneurship programs and previously built a tool for data handling, which currently has over 20,000 users. We're now looking to raise 500,000 pounds to onboard 10 customers onto our platform. The investment will give us an 18 months runway and allows us to hire three additional developers and one business development manager. At month six, we will have three paying customers and 500,000 pounds of yearly recurring revenue. Month 12, you will reach 1 million pounds in revenue. And month 18, we will have 10 paying customers, 2 million pounds in yearly recurring revenue, and we'll have completed our second round of funding. So join us on our journey of becoming the all-in-one platform for building trust in blockchain networks and empowering the Web3 revolution. Thank you, Till. So reminder, use the QR code, go to futureworlds.com forward slash ask to ask your questions. I can see there's a number that have already been coming through. Uh, Tom has asked, how confident are you in your revenue projections? You're pretty bullish on those slides. Yeah, we, we get confidence in our numbers by already having a paying customer. We, we also have a letter of intent from a similar company and a lot of interest from other blockchains. So with the investment, we'll be able to onboard all of these companies. And assuming that they are of similar size than our current customer, we will reach £2 million at month 18. And Henry has asked, what protection do you have in place to prevent your competition developing your capabilities? Yeah, so my team has a really deep understanding of the technology. We have developed state-of-the-art techniques to simulate blockchains and cyber attacks. And we also have a first mover advantage because we already have a company and a product. Uh, and Paul has asked, how would your application or platform predict a misconfigured node, like the example to prevent an outage? Yeah, so the company that had that problem was called Solana. So they could use our platform. They would access it through a web dashboard. They could run a simulation. They could try out different configurations. It would probably give them some advice on what configurations could be problematic. And they could see with our dashboard that there is a problem with this specific configuration so they could avoid it in their production network. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Sarah and others have asked, um, given the, the digital world changes so quickly, what, what if Web3 isn't really the great next generation of the internet that, that you've been touting? Yes. Yeah, so we've seen, obviously, the cryptocurrency prices have recently dropped. But there has been a lot of very positive developments in the whole blockchain industry. So, for example, 10% of the global population own cryptocurrencies. And more than $270 billion in assets have been transferred using blockchain. So I think the question is not, will we get mainstream adoption of blockchain, but rather, how can we make it even more usable, which is exactly what our mission is. As someone apparently called Elon Musk has asked, um, <laughs> where do you see your company in five years' time, and, and, and where might an exit be? Yeah, we, th we see, I think, three different routes for a potential exit. Um, first, we have kind of security, cybersecurity companies that do traditional cybersecurity, but they see this big opportunity in blockchain and want to move into blockchain, and that's where our platform would come in. Then second, we have the kind of crypto exchanges that acquire a lot of companies in this field because they want to get ahead of their competitors and use our service so they can offer the best crypto exchange. And then third, we have cloud providers like Google Cloud or AWS that have invested quite a lot recently into blockchain as well and could, could use our platform to simulate these networks. Uh, and, and Mike has just asked, what would the effect of potential regulation in crypto, and there's been lots of talk just this week in London Tech Week about regulation of crypto, um, what, what impact might that have on you? 
Yeah, it's been it's mentioned been mentioned a lot, and actually Rishi Sunak has said that he wants to make the UK a Web3 hub and really bring make UK a leading country in Web3 regulation. But actually, the we're not really affected by the cryptocurrencies because our platform really only focuses on the blockchain networks, the underlying technology that runs cryptocurrencies. So we don't interact with the crypto with the cryptocurrencies, which means we are not too affected by these regulations. There's a tough question from Cam, who, who said, look, you've laid out beautifully where you stand versus your competitors, indicating you're better than them. Great. Um, but if, if we would see their pitch deck uh, and, uh, from a competitor, what would they be saying about you in their analysis? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's a good, good question. Um, we've actually had conversations with both uh, Chain Analysis which obviously has a valuation of, of 8 billion, and also with Metrica. And they are fundamentally different of how they approach these um, problems because they really focus on the cryptocurrencies. They come from a financial background, but we come from the cybersecurity background. So there could be potential to collaborate with them, but they are fundamentally, fundamentally different of how they work. Uh, so there's been lots of changes, things like open AI and suddenly major investments into what were sort of open projects. Um, Ian has asked, how would a major investment in the open source uh, projects disrupt your opportunity? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I th I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, I think. So in terms of an investment into an open source project rather than us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, into some in, of the into open another of the competitors. That, that ecosystem that you're swimming in. Yeah, it's, it, ob obviously the whole blockchain ecosystem is built around uh, open source and transparency. But we've seen with these tools, for example, TestGround, we've seen that our customers have used these tools. For example, the one where we have the letter of intent. They were using TestGround, but it just ha didn't have the sufficient capabilities. And that's why we still see these outages. So that's why it's important that a platform like ours exists. Uh, and Simon has asked uh, the question, how can you help people avoid the dreaded picnic? Problem in chair, not in computer. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are at predicting it if people still make the error. So what else can be done to address that? To address outages. So well, to address where, where it, it's a human error, maybe misconfiguring the node. Like, how, how do you address those issues of emerging? Yeah, I think it, it's a common problem in, in software development. There, there will always be bugs, but what we do is we provide the tools that people can actually find these problems. And yes, it might be a manual problem, but we will be able to generate, generate a lot of data from blockchain simulations, which means we can actually give predictions of what might be human errors that could occur in the blockchain networks as well. Uh, right, and finally, um, Paul has asked a, a question. Um, like how did, so, sorry, um, as problems or issues are issued are only just being found, so new problems are emerging constantly, um, how are you predicting future issues that will potentially cause an outage that haven't been seen before? Yeah, it's exactly, I think, about this approach that is part of our roadmap. So part of these simulations, we will be able to generate, generate a lot of data um, about what is our common issues in blockchain networks. Through that, we can actually use, for example, AI and the advancements that have been in AI recently, where we can then predict issues that haven't been seen before. Till, thank you very much indeed. Round of applause. So just to remind you all, the key purpose is to connect you with these brilliant founders. So if you haven't already, make sure you've got that form open so that you can connect with any of the founders on this stage. But now let me welcome to the stage Laura Meehan. My name is Laura and I am co-founder of Journaly, the athlete-centered app addressing mental and physical ill health in high-performance sport. Now, Journaly is made up of myself, Laura, and my background is all about the psychology and my wonderful co-founder, Jessica, who is a computer scientist and elite athlete who isn't with me today because she's away at a very important training camp. Now, 
when we talk about sport, we often hear about this extra 1%. And what that represents is this extra edge that is needed to surpass the competition and to win. But there's a darker side to this that we don't often hear about. And I want to provide an example of that in Simone Biles. Now, Simone Biles is a highly decorated American gymnast and four times Olympic gold medalist. But in the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, she withdrew from the all-around finals, citing mental health concerns. Now, the reality is she is not the only one. One in six international athletes experience suicidal ideations. And it is estimated that over 63% of elite athletes experience depressive symptoms. So what are the solutions? Well, we have the mental health apps that are catering towards the needs of the general population. We have the journaling apps, which are largely generic or unpersonalized. And we have the athlete-centered apps, which largely focus towards physical health. Journaly fits right in the center here. The perfect combination of psychology, athlete-centered, and research-driven journaling. Now, we pride ourselves on that combination because when we started, we were very frustrated, along with many other people, with seeing these five smiley faces passing as good measures of mental health. The reality is they are not good enough. So instead, we have developed these buttons. We have transformed research-driven methods of screening for mental health and adapted them to create these simple buttons that can also be translated into clinical terminology when needed. But we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to provide a practical measure that athletes could use to help mitigate and improve their well-being. And that's where our journaling practices come in. Now, on the surface, these take the form of a simple question, something that the athlete can answer every day. But underneath that are layers and layers of psychology, the positive impact of which ranges from mental health to physical health, all the way to skills such as problem solving. Now, our next challenge was to bring that data to life so that it could be utilized effectively. So we take the data that the athlete has inputted and we transform that into an analytical overview, something that can not only help to inform the support team, but also be used to guide strategic decisions and training. Now, all of these elements come together to create the app that the athlete world truly needs. We will be generating revenue through app subscriptions, and the price of this varies depending on the size of the team and also the features that they require. We are currently in negotiations with three professional football teams, and those negotiations center around the testing and integration of our application into their current support programs. But we have the potential to expand beyond this into other high-performance areas that are significantly struggling. When we look at the business world, mental health is costing UK employers over 50 billion pounds annually. Now, I want to take you back to the statistics that I talked about right at the beginning. The reality is that there is a person behind every single one of those statistics. And for many of them, it will be the difference between life and death. That is the really, really sad reality of mental ill health. Now, at Journaly, we're not just passionate about changing that. We are absolutely determined to change that. And today, I would really like to invite you on that journey with us. That is why we are asking for the investment of time. If you're an advisor or have connections or work within the sporting industry or other high performance industries, we would love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us by scanning the code behind me, where you will also get the chance to view our very first MVP. Thank you. So I'll remind you again, remember, ask your questions through that link. But there's a load that have already been coming in. So Will has said, why have you chosen to focus on athletes? Well, Jessica is um, an elite athlete. So it was a very good opening for us. And we also have a very good understanding of the industry. 
Good answer. So there's a couple of people have asked, um, really related to coaches. So James has asked, how is your product different uh, or, or better than the coaches they already have access to? And Andreas has said, awesome pitch and product. What are the solutions that athlete support teams currently use? Okay, so um, the idea is that our application can be used to help assist the current um, setup. So the reason why we have the dashboard um, area is so that uh, coaches can actually be better informed. Currently, they have psychologists in, but they don't have that sort of real-time um, uh, feedback from how the athletes are feeling. Okay, and Kate has asked the question, is there a longer-term interest in widening your target beyond uh, elite athletes to a more mass market segment? You mentioned business. Uh, Kate would love to hear more about that potential target. Yeah, so the really great thing about this is the psychology that is um, the ground roots of the application. Um, it's very versatile. So we would like to expand, and that's our plan to expand, into other high-performance industries. So we see a major issue at the moment in sectors that are high-stress, such as advertisement or um, marketing. So those are the areas that we are likely to head to next. Fantastic. And Clementine has asked a similar question, but focused on high-pressured, high-performance environments like finance and law. Many investors in the room, maybe they are elite performers themselves. Um, how would you adapt it to, to those different markets? What, what would be different? So it depends how you want to utilize it. On an individual basis, we would take the core components of the app themselves. Whereas if you would like to utilize it for a team, for example, you change certain elements of the dashboard. So um, maybe you want to expand the amount of uh, people in your in your um, workforce to um, and gather a lot more data. Or maybe you want to look at a certain uh, different measure, say uh, workload capacity rather than training capacity. OK, and there's a question in from Chris. How do you overcome the fear around the security of data? This can be very sensitive data that people are putting in. Yeah, that's a very good question. So when we speak to people, um, their main worry about this is that their data isn't private. So how we overcome that is we save the data locally to the athlete's phone, um, to the user's phone, and they export it at will. And that's until we can put in measures to do end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, and Max has asked, what's the initial market size and, and how much of that could you grab? So the market size is quite hard to uh, define. But um, we are, so we are initially looking to go towards um, high professional football teams, and then we will expand beyond this into individual sports such as athletics. And also, we are looking about integrating our. We've got a lot of sort of good feedback about how it could be used in other areas of the organisation, say in football teams for HR. So we are planning to expand into that area as well. Uh, Alistair's asked and may be interested, why aren't you fundraising? <laughs> We've decided to bootstrap because um, we have some great connections and we're getting some good interest off of um, how things are going currently. So we are very, very pleased with how that is and we want to continue that journey. But that doesn't mean that investment isn't a future possibility for us. And Cam has said, looks amazing. How have elite athletes reacted to this? And do they have any concerns over coaches having access to perhaps a summary of, of potentially very poor mental health? You know, that's, it's a really interesting thing, actually, because I think we planned for that almost. We planned for this sort of hit back. But if anything, we've got the complete opposite. I had a meeting with um, an athlete who was very, very significantly struggled. And he seemed absolutely elated about the idea that he could... He didn't have to have that awkward conversation with his coach anymore. He could see on a bit of paper, um, sorry, on a screen, <laughs> that he wasn't quite ready for that element of training today. And that really, really excited him. And Hattie has asked a, a, a big question, really. How do, do you have responsibility if you see really negative su suicidal ideation that you mentioned? Um, kind of where does the responsibility stop? Yeah, well, we, we want to take that responsibility as well to look after our users. That's the reality of it. So during our testing, we do have those, um, we do have uh, um, procedures in place where they can get help externally. We are currently working on how we want to put that inside the app um, as well. And, and David has asked, how do you ensure compliance from users? Like, does it work if they miss uh, too many days? Yeah, that's a really interesting one, actually, and it's something that really excites me. So uh, a lot of the time we see that, oh, you have to do it every day. But the, actually, with this sort of type of journaling, you don't. The effects can be seen two weeks later sometimes. 
Great. And, and Brian has said that the screenshot you showed of the dashboard, is that live or is that a mock-up at this stage? Like what stage of development? It's a mock-up, but I'm, I'm glad it looks like a, such a good mock-up that it could be true. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And, and Amy has asked, is this a symptom tracker? Um, can users be connected to maybe third-party platforms through it? So it is a symptom tracker, um, and that's the exciting sort of next step for us as well to try and see what we can integrate into it through um, through watches. So that's what we're looking into. Uh, and then Matthew's got this question, a great pitch. Um, how would you stop maybe sometimes obsessive athletes then becoming obsessed with the mental health data on your dashboard? So, <laughs> yeah, this, but it, but it is a very, very good question because the reality is we do see things such as... Um, issues with eating disorders which are very common in athletes so it's a very very important question and that's why we have adapted our buttons so that they don't necessarily um, translate easily to the clinical terminology it's about keeping it as neutral and easy to fill in without getting people paranoid about what they're putting into the app and fabio's asked a key question does this count as a medical device no, not yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Aswin has said, what resources would you require to provide personal chat support to your customers? Is, is that the model? Chat support in terms of um, if they were to have suicidal thoughts and then uh, doing um, that sort of element of support, I'm, I'm assuming. So um, we, have, we have the power to do that. Jesse is a very, very good computer scientist, and it's about learning the database as well to make sure that we, um, we give the right kind of support, but that's completely within our means, yeah. Uh, and Dave has asked the question, what, what is the size of the problem within football teams specifically, if that's your first kind of customer base? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one. We actually see that some papers, are t um, some research papers are telling us that the problem can be as big as one in four athletes. And when we look into after injury or when the athlete has, has hurt themselves and they're suffering even more greatly, that can be as big as 80% or over. Laura, thank you very much indeed. Round of applause for the winner. <laughs> So a slide you've not seen before, make sure that you connect. If you can help Laura, if you can invest time into Journaly, then make sure you connect through that form. But let's not wait any longer. Please welcome to the stage, Sam Mundy. Our aim at Data Revival is to help the chemical and pharmaceutical industries uh, decrease their product development times. And we're going to enable them to do that by giving them access to their unstructured R&D data more effectively at scale through our AI platform. And the type of data that I'm talking about is the decades of unstructured knowledge that is sitting in their lab books on their bookshelves. It's sitting in their PDF files and their Excel spreadsheets distributed across IT systems. The type of data that holds so much value, but is so difficult to use in today's digital modern world. And the reason it's so difficult to use is that often there are chemical structures on the page, reaction schemes that mean so much to the chemists that drew them, but are so difficult for a computer to understand. There's often data in the tables, but because this is science, the data in the tables mean nothing without the context that goes with them. And companies that aren't looking to use their R&D resources are already falling behind. One of our early partners had an opportunity to enter a huge growing market, but they needed to develop a new product. But after six months of lab time, 16 scientists involved, they had nothing to show for their efforts. They realized that they needed to use their R&D archives better in an AI-enabled world. And this is exactly what Data Revival can do. We can take any of their document formats. We can take any type of chemistry. Our algorithms and our data sets can extract all of that insight, connect knowledge across people, projects, projects, and domains, and structure it in a way that our clients can make most value from. 
And so when our early partner used Data Revival system, they went from six months of lab time to two weeks. They went from 16 scientists to eight. They went from zero successful products to taking one product to trial. And it isn't just them that are finding this process painful. I've had top pharmaceutical executives come to me and say, Sam, we are desperate to move our in-house teams off these types of projects, but the current providers out in the market don't work well enough. I've had executives from top ELN providers who are building the digital data recording forms for the labs of the future, and they're saying that their own customers are desperate for a solution like this so that they can move their legacy ways of working and have them work with the new technology in the lab. And the reason that they're coming to us, the reason that they're coming to Data Revival is because of what, we, what we've built. A platform so powerful that in NASA's own words, it surpasses their own in its ability and its ability to work well. And because of this, we're already revenue generating. We've got proof of concept trials running with two of the largest chemical and pharmaceutical companies in the world. We're the recipient of an Innovate UK grant, and we've got so many opportunities on the table in front of us that we're struggling to keep up. And this is really why I'm here today. We are very, very quickly validating both the technology and the process. And we need to accelerate through this validation stage as quickly as possible so that we can properly execute on all of these opportunities. And when we do, we will be entering a huge market. Looking at a bottom-up approach at our addressable market across insurance, across law, across tech, across chemistry, across pharmaceuticals. This is a $4.5 billion market that is growing every year. And the obtainable market that we will be looking into first across chemistry and pharmaceuticals is already valued at over a billion dollars. The way that we enter this market is by working with small individual teams within our large commercial clients. But what we are already seeing is that other teams within those organizations hear about data revival and they need what we provide. And so our strategy is to work team by team by team, working through these big commercial clients until it makes sense to offer an enterprise-wide license. And the reason that they're coming to us is because they know that our platform has been built from the ground up to deal with the complex chemical and pharmaceutical data that they use. They know that it's been built from the ground up to work with their unstructured chemical resources that every other system out there cannot make use of. And they know that it's been built by chemists for chemists. So the results that are returned are what the chemists and pharmaceutical companies need. <coughs> and we've been able to do this because of who we are. Myself, Sam Monday. I've worked on this project for the last two years. I've seen it go from an idea in my head to what it is today. I lecture at Southampton and Oxford Universities, and I'm the recipient of an Innovate UK Young Innovator Award. And my co-founder, Professor Jeremy Frey, somebody who has worked in the industry in digital chemistry for over 35 years, somebody who's dedicated the latter part of his life to developing AI solutions for scientific discovery. And today, we're looking to raise 250,000 pounds. This will enable me to go full-time into the company. It will enable us to hire someone to take over the tech development so that I can focus on growth and scale and the business needs. It will enable us to get the hardware and to build the infrastructure so that over the next 18 months, we can get to a point where it's time to scale. And those 18 months look like this. In month zero, we will raise 250K. By month six, we will have, re uh, we will have hired and built the infrastructure. By month 12, we will be making 250k ARR based on our current revenue and our projections. And that will put us in a brilliant position by month 18 to complete a second, much larger funding round that is all about growth. So far at Data Revival, we have been a little team and a little company. But we have achieved some amazing success. So invest in us, invest in this company, invest in the future that we are building for ourselves and let's share in those amazing successes together. Thank you. Sam, thank you, that's fantastic. So remember, put your questions through the form. So I can see Yara has asked, how does your platform differ from online lab books which offer data extraction tools and remote tools? So the, I'm not, 
quite sure what you mean by an online lab book, but the electronic lab notebooks are very much about uh, getting digital data in a structured format from now and to the future. They don't offer a way of bringing archive data. They don't offer a way of bringing the ways that your chemists and scientists currently record their data into a platform that can be used. And actually, that's one of the reasons why some of these platform providers are talking to us already so that they can work with us. I can see there's a number of questions about large language models. OpenAI has, has been mentioned several times. So do you see OpenAI as a threat to data revival, especially the new computer vision features in GPT-4? Yeah, so um, the simple answer is no. Um, we see that um, these large language models, whilst they will increase in power and the way that they work, it's very difficult to stop them hallucinating. Also, these models aren't built around taking the types of unstructured chemical data that we're looking at. They're more about generating new information based on an input from the user. Uh, and so Dom wants to know, t tell us more about your competition. Are, are there not already AI companies and tools that are helping pharma and chemical companies to organize their data? There are an awful lot of tools that aren't just focused in the chemistry industry or the chemicals industry. Um, that are focused on uh, making unstructured or structured data um, more easy to use. So these are things that are like cognitive search, like Microsoft Azure's platform. Um, but actually what they look at is they look at the highly structured data that is coming in um, from, uh, from the new features. What we're looking at is all of the archives data. We're looking at all of the data that people still record in a way that doesn't make sense in a digital world. There are other organizations that have the same ethos of us um, in the insurance and law sectors. Um, but again, they're looking at more of the structured information from things like papers or patents. And they're not looking at their customers' proprietary R&D archives. Uh, so James has said, could you just talk a little bit more about how the tech actually works? Like, is it kind of data warehousing, pipeline approach, something more like a transformer, large language model? Give us a bit more of a deep dive. Yeah, so we've developed our own in-house uh, transformer models that are specifically tuned to work with chemical structures, chemical reaction schemes, the really important stuff that people record. But they've also, be, also been specifically tuned to work with uh, the highly unstructured data, so the stuff that's really, really difficult for, for most things to get out. There's also our training data sets that have been built specifically over a number of years that are highly, highly uh, curated um, that give us a lot of the power that we see in the models. Okay, um, there's a question from Max. So love the idea. How do users know the value of the product if they don't know what insights they're, they're missing now? Yeah, I think that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, and it was one of the things that we thought was going to be a massive hurdle in getting into organizations. Um, but with our first two clients, um, that hasn't been an issue. They've said that they either want to know what's in there because they want to be able to leverage it for AI, or they want to know, is it even worth keeping? Can we get rid of it? And the really interesting thing, I think, about this is that we also thought that we would just be looking at the legacy information. But with our first two clients, they actually want us to use it as a live platform so that everything that the scientists are doing now, they want to feed in there so that it's automatically put into the structured formats. Uh, and Alex has asked, how long does it take to train an AI model for your data extraction? I guess that's how long is a piece of string. So it very much depends on what you need to extract, and it very much depends on the size of the data sets that we need to use. To give a more explicit answer, um, our very first customer was one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And we were able to tune the platform for their specific problems uh, in less than a day. And so we are already working through a lot of the information that they have and we were able to do that very quickly. Uh, Andreas has asked the, the question, yeah, super interesting product, but how will the business scale? How do you get past this sort of project by project approach? Yeah, so the reason that we've gone for the project by project approach to begin with is because we need to understand the value add to our customers and we need to be able to get a foothold into these massive organizations. And if we can work with individual teams as standalone projects within these organizations, it's far easier to get in there. What we are now seeing is that other teams within these companies want to work with us. And so they will still be individual project by project. But the strategy is that once we have enough of those running in the early customers, we'll then be able to offer an enterprise-wide license. If we raise the investment, or if we continue to bootstrap, 
we will at some point have a fully cloud-ready enabled platform that will be run as a software as a service as well. And so that will enable users to use it <laughs> on their data as and when they need. And so maybe looking at the other end of the spectrum, Max is then asking, when in the future do you predict your product might no longer be useful, assuming that all the information continues to get better and better recorded in the future? Yeah, so um, that's another thing that we've wrestled with a lot. And actually, our, the, the research that this has come out of um, is very much into, well, what, are these, what is the future of the lab? And the results of this research is that we've been talking about electronic lab notebooks. We've been talking about structured digital chemical and pharmaceutical data for the last 20 years. And yet people are still recording things in a very archaic way. And there are really, really good reasons for that because science is all about flexibility. It's all about the story. And so it will not be in the foreseeable future that people stop recording information in a way that makes it very hard for digital systems to use. But if that future does arise, well then, we will pivot, and we already have ideas for this around we will know how people want to record their information. We will have the best idea in the world about what scientists in what sector doing what projects, how they need to record their data. And this is why we're already working very closely with electronic lab notebook providers, because this will be an absolute goldmine for them. OK, time for just one last question. Michael has asked, can you combine the customer's proprietary data with perhaps existing published data in journals, papers, etc.? Yeah, so our second client, um, who is a very large chemical company, that's exactly what they're hoping to do. They want to be able to combine what they have in their R&D archives, and they want to be able to look out beyond that into the literature and into the patent literature. And that's exactly what we've enabled them to do. Sam, thank you very much indeed. So I'll keep banging on about this. We want you to connect with startups where you've got relevant skills, expertise, insight, or you want to explore potential investment. Use the form to connect with Sam. But let's move straight on to welcome to the stage Dr. Sylvia Barker. At Microvita, we've developed a biotech platform to comprehensively and efficiently characterize drug candidates for pharmaceutical companies. And let me tell you this, drug development is in a serious need of modernization. Currently, over 40% of drugs fail clinical trials because they're either found toxic or just simply not effective. This costs the pharmaceutical industry over 400 million per drug in wasted time and resources. And it's because animal models used to simulate the human body are just simply not predictive. Here, tiny human-derived models called organ on a chip that can emulate the physiology and functionality of a human organ are revolutionizing the way drug discovery is done. For instance, a study conducted using liver on a chip demonstrated 87% improvement in the prediction of liver toxicity, and there were no false positives found, found in that study. But the limitation of these chip systems lies in extracting data. Typically, the biological sample needs to be removed from the chip for analysis, but this process is very cumbersome, and it can only be done at the end of an experiment. This, cause, this causes a very slow turnaround times with two or even three months delays in obtaining results. At Microvita, we're changing this. We're combining the cutting edge chip technology with magnetic resonance spectroscopy to unlock continuous access to complex, comprehensive data from living biological samples. We are the only technology that can obtain comprehensive data without the need to terminate the experiment. And we can analyze that data in real time. 
we have proof of concept studies covering all in vitro models. This means that we can cut out that wait time and get medicines to the market quicker. Feedback from the industry says it all. We have a fantastic technology that will make a huge impact in the pharmaceutical industry. And we already have three customers that are engaging with us and, with, and they will run paid, paid trials, including one big pharmaceutical company. But how big is the opportunity? It costs 1.2 billion to bring a single drug to the market, but 90% of that is spent pursuing failures. To be specific, we can address the toxicity and efficacy testing, which constitutes 40% of those failures. Implementation of our technology will result in higher quality candidates, meaning that fewer toxic or not effective medicines will enter clinical trials. And if we can improve that success rate just by 10%, we can save 100 million per drug. Now annually, 50 drugs are brought to the market. This means that we can save over 5 billion if we can improve that success rate just by 10%. And we're confident we can do much better than that. And so how are we going to make money? Uh, we have two possible revenue streams, a fee-for-service where we will work on the contract basis or a direct sale of our integration systems, the chips itself, and data analytics. Our team consists of myself, Dr. Sylvia Barker, and my co-founder, Professor Marcel Oetz. I have a PhD in this technology, which has been very well received in discussions with our customers. Marcel is a world leader in combining the chip technology with magnetic resonance, and he holds multiple patents. Together, we have over 35 years of experience in this field. And today, we are looking for 550,000 investment. The money will give us an 18 month runway and will allow us to employ two additional researchers to hit important milestones. Today, we have one patent, and an MVP tested in the lab. Over the next 18 months, we will work with our partners to run pilot studies, automate the tech, and generate further IP. We are predicting a full-scale launch by 2027. But today, right now, we have three customers lined up to do paid trials, meaning that we will be re generating revenue from day one, which is pretty unheard of in biotech. Our technology will revolutionize drug discovery. So we are looking to connect with equally ambitious investors and partners to join us on our mission to minimize animal testing, accelerate drug discovery, and make it viable to, to develop any medicine, no matter how rare the disease. So remember, put your questions through the form. Uh, I can see there's a question from Chris, which is, do you need a magnetic resonance spectrometer to use MicroVita? No, so one of our revenue models is that we can perform all of those uh, testing in-house, working on a contract basis. But just to give you a perspective, magnetic resonance is a standard technique used in chemical industry. So every single pharmaceutical company has a spectrometer as well as research centers. And it's estimated that about, there are two, about 2,000 spectrometers just in the UK. Uh, and I can see a question from Anna, which is, what's your predicted, um, pro sorry, projected reduction in the number of animals required for testing? Because you talked about that. Yes, so we have proof of concept studies covering all in vitro models, including cells, spheroids, as well as most advanced tissue on a chip technology. So our tissue on a chip technology replaces live animals with microscale living tissue samples, which means that instead of using a single animal per test, we can use every, sorry to be gruesome, organ within that animal for testing meaning that we can run hundreds of tests on a single animal. And we've estimated that we could re reduce testing by at least 60%.
So Fabio has asked, can you explain a bit more about how your system works? Like what kind of data can you collect? Are there uh, limitations like monolayer versus 3D cell models? Uh, so we are based on, um, so with, uh, we're collecting m metabolomics data and that we have no limitations uh, currently in the models that we can Im, um, integrate. Whatever you can culture within the standard Petri dishes within the incubator system, we can replicate that within an NMR spectrometer. Okay, and Simon has asked the question, you had 300,000 of grant on, on the finance wheel. Is that already acquired? And if so, will some of the investment be used as a match uh, for that grant? So the investment is exactly um, for that. So it's match funding for that grant. And um, yes, we have been selected from a, a large number of people to apply for that exclusive grant. And we are confident uh, with ama and have amazing track records in applying for grants. So um, we're confident we have that in the bag. Uh, and Alistair has asked, has anyone else tried to do this? What is it that makes it difficult to do? Our team is very um, skilled. So in order to rep reproduce our technology, you have to have skills in biology, RF engineering, quantum mechanics, and so it's very hard to find a uh, team that has these skills. And that combination make us very unique. But additionally, we have also a patent that covers the invention. Uh, so Mike has asked, does your process comply with FDA requirements? So we are in discussions with the FDA. And we, uh, they are very welcome. The, um, some of you might be aware that there has been a FDA Modernization Act uh, introduced recently, which doesn't, which, which doesn't require animal testing to go through to clinical stages. So they're very uh, happy to, to view or welcome new technologies. And we are actually so, yes, so we are. <laughs> Uh, and Graham has asked, how expensive is your system versus commercial organ on a chip uh, systems? So this is one of the areas that we're going to be testing uh, within our clients. But uh, the differentiating factor is that our devices are made of thermoplastics, which, are, which is a sca scalable method of production. Other devices use a different polymer that cannot be easily, well, there are no methods to scale that production, so it's very expensive while we are relying on very scalable manufacturing methods. Okay, uh, and there's another question. Um, you mentioned different business models, you mentioned three paying customers. Which, which models will those customers be adopting? <coughs> uh, two of our customers are going to be using the direct sale model and one will be the fee for service. Uh, and Ian has asked, is there a large hardware cost to scale up or, or even to just do the initial proof of concept? So we have all of the facilities in-house and we are currently talking to manufacturers, um, but we do not anticipate that there will be a, a large, uh, in, large investment needed because all of the parts that we use are uh, just standard equipment that can be purchased at scale. And James has said, yeah, great pitch. It seems like you've been saving these drug companies many millions of dollars. So w what is your project projected um, kind of revenue stream maybe looking five years forward? This is exactly what we're going to be testing now with the customers. And um, so I, can, I'm, I can't answer that question right now. <laughs> It's a work in progress. That's what exactly. the investment will help you to work out. Um, so um, uh, G has asked, um, how much money could you capture from what the pharma companies would be saving through using your technology? Again, with the customer testing now, we are going to work out exactly in which areas that um, we're going to exceed the tests as well, which tests we will replace, but we can the, the market size that we can capture is the 60% saving in animal costs, which varies depending on what animal testings you, pref uh, we, you perform. And, and Alice has asked, could you adapt this to use patient tissues, perhaps for personalized medicine, drug effic efficacy testing? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the areas that we are looking to expand, is that we could use 
uh, patient-derived biopsies to test uh, the performance of drugs directly onto patients' uh, tissues. Sylvia, thank you very much indeed. Round of applause. <laughs> so a reminder to connect with Sylvia. Use the form if you want to follow up with Sylvia. Jot in there what the particular angle or interest is of how you would like to follow up. But now we have just one last pitch to come. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Andy Chapanis. Xgenera has developed a blood test that will revolutionize cancer diagnosis. Almost half of all cancers are diagnosed at a late stage, where survival rates can be as low as 10%. These same cancers, however, if identified at an early stage, can have survival rates of over 90%. The problem is, early diagnosis is currently reliant on screening assays, but these suffer from several key limitations. Firstly, they're only available for three types of cancer and they can only test for one of these cancers at a time. They also lack the sensitivity at this crucial early stage, and they have an extremely low specificity, which means for every one cancer they correctly identify, they incorrectly say 18 people have cancer when they don't. And so, we've developed <clears throat> MyOnco. MyOnco is a blood-based, multi-cancer, early diagnostic test. With just a small amount of blood and our patented panel of biomarkers, and artificial intelligence, we were able to identify cancer more accurately than any test currently available, increasing patient survival. MyOnco can identify 12 types of cancers. That's roughly 68% of all new cancer cases in one test simultaneously. We have an extremely high sensitivity of 99%, which means we can pick up 99% of cancer patients at stage one, two, three, and four. And we have an extremely high specificity, <clears throat> which means we can identify 50 correct cancer patients before getting just one wrong, where currently it's one right for every 18 wrong. MyOnco has the potential to save hundreds of thousands of lives every year. Currently, of the 990,000 cancers that MyOnco can target in the US and UK, half of those will unfortunately die. However, with MyOnco, we can save over an additional 300,000 lives every year. Not only can my uncle save hundreds of thousands of lives every year, we can save billions in dollars. Currently, there are around 9 million screening assays performed every year in the UK, and around 120 million every year in the US. And in the US, around $110 billion is spent on screening, early stage cancer costs, late stage cancer costs, and false positives. Now, if MyOnco is to be used, screening costs would go up by 10 billion because we're identifying four times the number of cancers, and early stage cancer care costs would go up by 13 billion <clears throat> because we're identifying them earlier. However, false positive costs would come down by 14 billion because of our specificity, and late stage cancer care costs would come down by 47 billion because we're identifying them earlier where treatment is cheaper saving over, sorry, over $38 billion every year. With the need for such a test comes competition. And three of our competitors here, Exact Sciences, Ellipta, and Grail, all fail to pick up over half of all the cancers at this crucial stage one point where we pick up 99% of them. They also will have or do have a high cost per test and this is predominantly due to their instrument dependence. Where they rely on expensive instrumentation, we use standardized equipment, which means our cost per test is cheaper and our scalability is higher. The team behind NextGenera is myself, Dr. Andy Shapanis, and my co-founder, Professor Paul Skip. Together, we have years of experience in precision medicine and biosciences and using machine learning and artificial intelligence for diagnostics and prognostics. <clears throat> 
With us, we have a team of consultants and advisors who know the in vitro diagnostic space exceptionally well and who can help us build out the team required. So far, we have developed and validated our test on data from 20,000 patients, and we're currently working on translating it into a cheaper, faster, and more scalable approach. And now we're asking for investment to prepare us for the next optimization phase to reduce the cost further and increase the throughput even more. We will then do a clinical validation study, which will, give us, which will give us the clinical evidence required to sell our product as a research use only tool in the first instance towards a revenue stream, but ultimately lead towards FDA MHRA approval to give us a test that we can sell to healthcare providers around the world. This, however, is just the start. The technology that Xgenera has developed that underpins MyOnco can be used for a multitude of other areas. And these are all projects that we will investigate in future R&D projects. And we've already begun investigating increasing the number of cancers that we can identify. To do all of this, however, requires investment. And that's why today, we are asking for four million pounds. This will carry us through that optimization phase and that crucial clinical validation study. And it will help us build out the team required and needed to make X genera what it needs to be. So join us today in revolutionizing cancer diagnosis. Thank you. So you can ask your questions not through that link, but through the ask link that hopefully you're pretty familiar with already. And I can see a number of people have already been sharing their questions. Uh, so Grace has asked, what is it that you do different to your competitors that gives you such a higher sensitivity at early stage detection? Yeah, really great and crucial question. So essentially, a lot of these competitors, they focus on uh, a specific type of biomarker called methylated DNA or circulating tumor cells. And what we've done is, we've used a radically new approach because their method essentially looks at the signal from a cancer. So as the cancer gets more and more developed, you get more of a signal. So they're great at stage three and stage four detection, but this is already too late as we've seen. So what we do differently is we use uh, micro RNA. And essentially it means that we can measure the signal from the cancer, the signal from the body to the cancer, like the host response, sorry, and also the development of the cancer because normally it's, 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 it's an environment that's given off that allows a tumor to sort of grow. Uh, Rob has asked, um, Grail is offering their gallery test for $950. How much will your test cost? Again, I'm glad someone asked the question. So <clears throat> theirs is an expensive $950. Ours currently is around 150 pounds. We know we can optimize this further though. Uh, Mike S. has asked, post-clinical validation, how will Myonco scale up by country and by business model? Is it insurance-led? You know, what does that look like? Yeah, again, so the first instance, we're going to work towards a research use only product or a test called what's it, a laboratory design test over in the States, uh, which will just give us that first revenue stream, which allows us to then grow from there. But essentially, yeah, we, all the meanwhile, we'll, we'll be paralyzing our FDA and MHRA um, submission so that we can get an in vitro diagnostic kit as soon as possible. And Sarah has asked, um, what are you measuring in the test that is present across all the different cancer types and, and all stages? Can you assess what stage as well as if the cancer is present? So currently we don't measure the stage, we're just, we're just focusing on identifying them at, stage, at every stage. Um, essentially what we're using, as I said, is it's called microRNA. Um, but yeah, th this, this is what allows us to do this, yeah. Okay, uh, and another Sarah has asked, how does your four million seed raise compared to uh, other competitors in the field? Uh, so most of the other competitors at their seed, uh, seed round raise roughly between five and six million. This is normally because they have to factor in um, a clinical um, uh, validation study as well, but normally it's in the form of a prospective clinical trial which is expensive and takes a lot of time. We're fortunate enough that we have clinical studies that have already taken place at the University of Southampton, and, we've given, and we have access to those samples. Great. Uh, Robert has asked, um, in your competitors, you listed mostly startups. What's going on with larger diagnostics companies? Why haven't they done this already? So uh, Grail is actually in the process, or not anymore, maybe. It's a weird one, uh, being acquired by Illumina who are obviously one of the biggest biotech companies around. And there are other areas, Roche are obviously looking into it, but a lot of these, I think, are waiting for the technology to become apparent 
uh, to know where to follow. And, you know, obviously, I think they're going to be looking our way. <laughs> Uh, Ruben has asked, um, what's the form factor and the cost of the test today? So the cost of the test is around £150, um, but we know we can bring this down. Um, this is off list price, off of uh, shelf products that we know. In fact, I've already got a 30% discount on those just, just now. Uh, but as we bulk buy and as we optimize it to make it even higher throughput, um, you know, there are some certain instances where we can increase the throughput just by changing how we load the plate those sort of things that will bring the cost down and further and further. Uh, someone has asked, what kind of cancer types can be uh, tested? Uh, so we've targeted the 12 most, um, well, the highest incidence and highest lethality of cancers. Uh, so it's the lung, breast, bowel, uh, cervical, uh, all, all of the above. Uh, but obviously we want to expand it. It's just these are obviously the, the biggest unmet need now. And so that's where we decided to target. Uh, and Alistair has asked, how do you know that you can identify 99% of stage one? Is that an exact number based on your study? Yeah, it's a great question. So the 20,000 uh, patients that we've, the data from the 20,000 patients that we've uh, analyzed, we split it into a train and a test. Uh, and that train was used to develop the model, the machine learning, the neural network and the support vector machine. Uh, and then the test set was a completely holdout separate data set that we didn't touch until the end. And that, the sensitivity and specificity that I showed you here, is based off of those recordings of, those, of that test set. And we actually held an extra set of validation sets for our own peace of mind. Uh, and Dom has asked, how will cancer patients be able to use this service? Is it private? Is it NHS? Kind of, what does that look like? Ultimately, we want it to be as available as possible. We want everyone to be able to use it. We want it to be, you know, essentially part of a, an MOT, a human MOT, so you can have it as frequently or infrequently as you like, so that if it's ever a concern or a, or a clinician or a physician wants to rule it out or rule it in, they can do it immediately with ease and at speed. Uh, and Simon has asked, in the segmented commercial healthcare markets like the USA, do you see resistance from the parts of the bar graph that are going down, losing money, essentially? Uh, I, don't, I don't see too much resistance. In fact, everyone that's entering this space, uh, th there is a lot of need for this. And as we're getting further and further through, or more into, you know, how can we solve cancer, or how can we, what's the best fight against cancer, the biggest response is always that we need to just identify it earlier, for now, and then we can cut it out and get rid of it. And, you know, this speaks for the NHS, for instance, that this, they've set a goal but that by uh, 2027, 20, uh, I believe, they want to identify 75% of all cancers at stage one, stage two. So everyone knows now that it is the need. Uh, Stefano has asked, um, what is your sustainable, in capital letters, competitive advantage versus what Grail has been doing, and, and why is that sustainable? So it de depends how you define sustainable, but from what I think you're sort of saying is that um, they're using next-generation sequencing to do all their analyses, and that's bottlenecked by essentially the instrument manufacturers. Um, our system uses standardized equipment, which means that there are already a large uh, supply of manufacturers for those uh, instruments, and it means that the test in itself is more sustainable. The, they're always going to be around. They've been these you know, qPCR machines. You've heard about them through uh, the COVID qPCR scans. You know, there's a, a huge influx of them. There's, a, there's enough of them. Uh -huh. uh, and Ben has asked, if you are using AI as part of your system, won't that bring potential errors because AI systems may give wrong predictions? Absolutely. There is an inherent risk with any prediction. Uh, your clinician will have an inherent risk with their experience. Um, but essentially, what we will do is we will lock our machine learning model, our prediction model, at the end, especially when we're going for this FDA approach or the FDA and MHRA submission. It, it's a requirement so that you have a locked prediction model. So they understand the exact sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, all of these parameters. They know exactly that, that they are true. Okay, and one last question, perhaps related to that. Virginia has asked, have you considered the issue of bias in, in the training of your model? Yeah, so we account for that. Um, you know, within machine learning, there are a lot of things that we can do or things that we have to check before. Uh, we do these analyses to ensure that there aren't a bias in sort of it. But essentially, we, we create an even distribution between the, the train test and validation. And, you know, we do things like oversampling and undersampling only on the training to make sure that we get a, a good enough test but on the test and validation it is just those data we don't manipulate them at all but i mean if you'd like to talk more about it in the future then please do come find me andy thank you very much indeed <laughs>
So, one last time, I'm going to remind you to use the form to connect with any of the founders that you have seen pitch here today. And there is a reason why I want you to connect. And I'm going to share a short, simple, and I think beautiful story that I picked up in the years uh, that I was working in Kenya in East Africa. And it's the simple story of an old man, a Mzee in Kenya, who was sitting after the rains had fallen, watching a small young girl who was sitting, well, she was standing with a small cup. And the rain was flowing down, and the, the puddles were everywhere, and it was flowing down both sides of a street. And the old man noticed that this girl with a cup was lifting the water from one side of the road and tipping it into the puddle on the other side of the road. And the girl kept on doing this. The mose was sitting there watching her for more than an hour. And every, every time she just picked up a cup of water from one side and tipped it into the other. And eventually the old man stood up and he went to the girl and he said, I've been watching you. Why are you tipping the water from one puddle to another? And the girl looked at the old man, and she smiled, and she said, well, look, this puddle, it runs down, and it trickles down the side of that road, and it runs into a puddle further down there, and it goes nowhere. But I've noticed that on this side of the road, the puddle trickles down there into a small stream, and that stream runs into the river at the bottom of the village, and I'm told that that river runs into Lake Victoria the largest body of water on the continent of Africa. And from there, it flows into the Nile, where it flows through many countries, and millions of people depend on those waters. So the water in this side does nothing, but the water on that side joins with other water and grows in momentum and grows in power and millions of people, and the world is changed because of it. And it is a simple story of the difference that is made. And I hope you'll agree, six brilliantly talented startup founders pitching incredible ideas that could change the world. But the reason we want you to connect is because the difference that is made when the right people, the right resources come around startup founders and it turns from a puddle that is going nowhere into a great torrent that can change the shape of the world. That is why we want you to connect. So use the form, speak to the startup founders afterwards. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you.